Chapter Two. It was strange, but Merrick never came in the after days and thanked his uncle for that sharp dose of physical and mental pain. Even when he was a man, he dreamed of Mister Horbury and woke up in a cold sweat, and then would fall asleep again with a great sigh of relief and gladness as he realized that he was no longer in the power of that infernal old swine. That filthy, canting, cruel brute, as he roughly called his old master. The fact was, as some old Laptonians remarked, the two had never understood one another. With the majority of the boys, the high usher passed for a popular master enough. He had been a distinguished athlete in his time, and up to his last days at the school was a football enthusiast. Indeed, he organized a variety of the Lupton game, which met with immense popularity till the head was reluctantly compelled to stop it. Some said because he always liked to drop bitter into Horbury's cup when possible. Others, and with more probability on their side, maintained that it was in consequence of a report received from the school doctor to the effect that this new species of football was rapidly setting up an old species of heart disease in the weaker players. However, that might be, there could be no doubt as to Horbury's intense and deep-rooted devotion to the school. His father had been a Leptonian before him. He himself had gone from the school to the university, and within a year or two of taking his degree, he had returned to Lupton to serve as its master. It was the general opinion in public school circles that the high usher had counted for as much as Chesson, the headmaster, if not for more, in the immense advance in prestige and popularity that the school had made. And everybody thought that when Chesson received the Episcopal order, Horbury's succession was a certainty. Unfortunately, however, there were wheels within wheels, and a total stranger was appointed. A man who knew nothing of the famous Lupton traditions, who it was whispered had been heard to say that this athletic business was getting a bit overdone. Mister Horbury's friends were furious, and Horbury himself, it was supposed, was bitterly disappointed. He retreated to one of the few decent canonries which have survived the wave of agricultural depression, but those who knew him best. Doubted whether his ecclesiastical duties were an adequate consolation for the loss of that coveted headmastership of Lupton. To quote the memoir which appeared in the Guardian soon after his death, over some well-known initials, his friends were shocked when they saw him at the residence. He seemed no longer the same man. He had aged more in six months, as some of them expressed themselves, than in the dozen years before. The old joyous Horbury, full of mirth, an apt master of wordplay and logic fence, was somehow dimmed. To use the happy phrase of a former colleague, the dean of Dorchester, old boys who remembered that sparkle of his wit, the zest which he threw into everything, making the most ordinary form work better fun than the games at other schools, as one of them observed, missed something indefinable from the man whom they had loved so long and so well. One of them, who had perhaps penetrated as closely as any into the arcana of Horbury's friendship, a privilege which he will ever esteem as one of the greatest blessings of his life, tried to rouse him with an extravagant rumor which was then going the round of the popular press, to the effect that considerable modifications were about to be introduced into the compulsory systems of games at X, one of the greatest of our great public schools. Horbury flushed. The old light came into his eyes. His friend was reminded of the ancient warhorse who hears once more the inspiring notes of the trumpet. "I can't believe it," he said, and there was a tremor in his voice. "They wouldn't dare! Not even why the headmaster of X would do such a scoundrelly thing as that. I won't believe it." But then the flush soon faded, and his apathy returned. After all, he said. I shouldn't wonder if it were so. Our day is past, I suppose, and for all I know, they may be construing the breviary and playing dominoes at X in a few years' time. I am afraid that those last years at Wareham were far from happy. He felt, I think, out of tune with his surroundings.
and Pache the readers of The Guardian, I doubt whether he was ever quite at home in his stall. He confessed to one of his old associates that he doubted the wisdom of the whole cathedral system. What, he said, in his old characteristic manner, would St. Peter say if he could enter this building and see that gorgeous window in which he is represented with mitre, cope, and keys? And I do not think that he was ever quite reconciled to the daily recitation of the liturgy accompanied as it is in such establishments by elaborate music and all the pomp of the surpliced choir. Rome and water, Rome and water, he has been heard to mutter under his breath as the procession swept up the nave, and before he died, I think that he had the satisfaction of feeling that many in high places were coming round to his views. But to the very last, he never forgot Lupton. A year or two before he died, he wrote the great school song, Follow, Follow, Follow. He was pleased, I know, when it appeared in the Leptonian, and a famous old boy informs me that he will never forget Horbury's delight when he was told that the song was already a great favorite in Chantry. To many of your readers, the words will be familiar, but I cannot resist quoting the first verse. I am getting old and gray, and the hills seem far away, and I cannot hear the horn that once proclaimed the morn. When we sallied forth upon the chase together, for the years are gone, alack, when we hastened on the track, and the huntsman's whip went crack, as a signal to our pack, riding in the sunshine and fair weather, and yet across the ground I seem to hear a sound, a sound that comes up floating from the hollow, and its note is very clear, as it echoes in my ear, and the words are Lupton, follow, follow, follow. Chorus Lupton, follow away, the darkness lies behind us, and before us is the day. Follow, follow the sun, the whole world's to be one. So Lupton, follow, 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 follow away. An old pupil sang this verse to him on his deathbed, and I think, perhaps, that some at least of the readers of The Guardian will allow that George Horbury died fortified, in the truest sense, with the rights of the church the church of a great aspiration. Such was the impression that Mr. Horbury had evidently made upon some of his oldest friends. But Merrick was, to the last, an infidel. He read the verses in The Guardian, he would never subscribe to the Leptonian, and jeered savagely at the whole sentiment of the memoir, and at the poetry, too. Isn't it incredible, he would say, Let's allow that the main purpose of the great public schools is to breed brave, average boobies by means of rocker, sticker, and mucker, and the rest of it. Still, they do acknowledge that they have a sort of pererecon, the teaching of two great literatures, two literatures that have molded the whole of Western thought for more than two thousand years. And they pay an animal like this to teach these literatures, a swine that has not enough literature of any kind in him, to save the soul of a louse. Look at those verses. Why, a decent fourth-form boy would be ashamed to put his name to them. He was foolish to talk in this fashion. People merely said that it was evident he was one of the failures of the great public school system, and the song was much admired in the right circles. A very well-turned Edom Latin appeared in The Guardian shortly after the publication of the memoir and the initials at the foot of the version were recognized as those of a literary dean. And on that autumn evening, far away in the seventies, Merrick the boy left Mr. Horbury's study in a white fury of grief and pain and rage. He would have murdered his master without the faintest compunction, nay, with a huge delight. Psychologically, his frame of mind was quite interesting, though he was only a schoolboy, who had just had a sound thrashing for breaking rules. But the fact, of course, was that Horbury, the irritating influence of the head's conversation and sherry apart, was by no means a bad fellow. He was for the moment savagely cruel, but then most men are apt to be savagely cruel when they suffer from an inflamed liver and offensive superiors, more especially when there is an inferior warranted defenseless in their power. But, in the main, Horbury was a very decent specimen of his class, English schoolmaster, 
and Merrick would never allow that. In all his reasoning about schools and schoolmasters, there was a fatal flaw. He blamed both for not being what they never pretended to be. To use a figure that would have appealed to him, it was as if one quarreled with a plain old-fashioned meeting-house because it was not in the least like Lincoln Cathedral. A chimney may not be a decorative object, but then it does not profess to be a spire or a pinnacle far in the spiritual city. But Merrick was always scolding meeting-houses because they were not cathedrals. He had been heard to rave for hours against useful, unpretentious chimney-pots because they bore no resemblance to celestial spires. Somehow or other, possibly by inheritance, possibly by the influence of his father's companionship, he had unconsciously acquired a theory of life which bore no relation whatever to the facts of it. The theory was manifest in his later years, but it must have been stubbornly, if vaguely, present in him all through his boyhood. Take, for instance, his comment on poor Canon Horbury's verses. He judged those, as we have seen, by the rules of the fine art of literature, and found them rubbish. Yet any old Leptonian would have told him that to hear the whole six hundred boys join in the chorus, leapt and follow away, was one of the great experiences of life, from which it appears that the song, whatever its demerits from a literary point of view, fully satisfied the purpose for which it was written. In other words, it was an excellent chimney, but Merrick still persisted in his easy and futile task of proving that it was not a bit like a spire. Then again, one finds a fallacy of still huger extent in that major premise of his, that the great public schools purpose to themselves as a secondary and minor object the imparting of the spirit and beauty of the Greek and Latin literatures. Now, it is very possible that at some distant period in the past this was an object, or even, perhaps, the object, of the institutions in question. The humanists, it may be conjectured, thought of school and university as places where Latin and Greek were to be learned, and to be learned with the object of enjoying the great thought and the great style of the antique world. One sees the spirit of this in Rabelais, for example. The classics are a wonderful adventure. To learn to understand them is to be a spiritual Columbus, a discoverer of new seas and unknown continents, a drinker of new old wine in a new old land. To the student of those days, a mysterious drowned Atlantis again rose splendid from the waves of the great deep. It was these things that Merrick, unconsciously doubtless, expected to find in his school life. It was for the absence of these things that he continued to scold the system in his later years, wherein, like Jim and Huckleberry Finn, he missed the point by a thousand miles. The Latin and Greek of modern instruction are, of course, most curious and interesting survivals, no longer taught with any view of enabling students to enjoy and understand either the thought or beauty of the originals, taught rather in such a manner as to nauseate the learner for the rest of his days with the very notion of these lessons. Still, the study of the classics survives, a curious and elaborate ritual from which all sense and spirit have departed. One has only to recollect the form master's lessons in the Odyssey or the Bacchae, and then to view modern Freemasons celebrating the mystic death and resurrection of Hiram Abiff. The analogy is complete, for neither the master nor the Masons have the remotest notion of what they are doing. Both persevere in strange and mysterious actions from inveterate conservatism. Merrick was a lover of antiquity, and a special lover of survivals, but he could never see that the round of Greek syntax and Latin prose, of elegiacs, and verbs in Greek me, with the mystery of the oratio obliqua and the optative, was one of the most strange and picturesque survivals of modern life. It is to be noted, by the way, that the very meaning of the word scholar has been radically changed. Thus, a well-known authority points out that melancholy Burton had no scholarship in the real sense of the word, 
he merely used his vast knowledge of ancient and modern literature to make one of the most entertaining and curious books that the world possesses. True scholarship, in the modern sense, is to be sought for not in the Jacobean translators of the Bible, but in the Victorian revisers. The former made the greatest of English books out of their Hebrew and Greek originals. But the latter understood the force of the aorist. It is curious to reflect that scholar once meant a man of literary taste and knowledge. Merrick never mastered these distinctions, or, if he did so in later years, he never confessed to his enlightenment, but went on railing at the meeting-house, which, he still maintained, did pretend to be a cathedral. He has been heard to wonder why a certain dean, who had pointed out the vast improvements that had been effected by the revisers, did not employ a few young art students from Kensington to correct the infamous drawing of the fourteenth-century glass in his cathedral. He was incorrigible, he was always incorrigible, and thus, in his boyhood, on the dark November evening, he meditated the murder of his good master and uncle, for at least a quarter of an hour. His father, he remembered, had always spoken of Gothic architecture as the most wonderful and beautiful thing in the world, a thing to be studied and loved and reverenced. His father had never so much as mentioned Rocker, much less had he preached it as the one way by which an English boy must be saved. Hence Ambrose maintained inwardly that his visit to Selden Abbey was deserving of reward rather than punishment, and he resented bitterly the savage injustice, as he thought it, of his caning. <laughs>